how would you hope that you have helped humanity the most? I want to be remembered as that Nobel laureate that didn't have any protocol that could work with anyone that could be in any space that could embrace and engage anyone. Lima Bowie certainly connected with me during this conversation from series three of the podcast. She recalls harrowing tales of war, but also inspiring stories about helping people in need. So I really hope you'll enjoy this encore presentation of the episode with Lima Bowie and share in that sense of connection that I felt. I see myself as the one who never gives up, always thinking, how do I change this year? The future is female. That popular catchphrase has particular resonance for the West African nation of Liberia, where one woman rallied thousands of others to demand peace after 13 years of war. This is Nobel Prize Conversations. You just heard Lema Bowie, the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize laureate and peace activist who formed the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace to call for an end to the Liberian Civil War, a goal that was achieved in 2003. She was awarded the prize together with Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Yemeni human rights activist Tawakol Karman for their non-violent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peacebuilding work. Bowie's own life was irrevocably changed by the war. July of 1990, I woke up a 18-year-old, ready to go to university. And by 10 o'clock in the afternoon, I became an adult. Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Seit Stiftung. In his conversation with Lema Bowie, she talks about her journey from pamper child to refugee to activist and why she was lucky not to have a brother. But first, she looks back at her decade as a Nobel Prize laureate and the continuing struggle to make the world listen, really listen, to women. We last spoke 10 years ago on the 7th of October 2011, when I called you from NobelPrize.org, just after you'd heard the news of your receipt of the Nobel Prize. Yes. And you said a very nice thing. You said women make up 50% of the world, and you hope that this signals that their skills, talents, and intelligence should be utilised. Do you think that in the last 10 years, there's been good progress in that direction? I think... There's been a lot of progress in 10 years, but with every progress, there are challenges. And so my, my joy is that the intensity with which women's voices, their intellectual ability, their hard work, their visibility has been challenged. My joy is the pushback or the comeback with which they, they present the rest of the world. So when you have a brutal regime or a racist regime or a regime that is not sensitive to the needs of women, what we've seen is women from all over the world rising up. So just as the the global challenges has increased, so has the voices of women increased over the last 10 years. Just as the pushback there's been a pushback for women to go back into the kitchen. There's been a comeback for women to be visible. So what I have seen in 10 years is a lot of success, but also a lot of doubling of efforts by women to ensure that the status quo is no longer the same. But it's not seamless progress, is it? I mean, there's constant pushback, as you say. So it's it's just a never-ending battle. It is a never ending battle. And one of my joys, again, is that over maybe 20 years ago, when we scored one success or 25 years ago, let's take, for example, 
a resolution 1325 by the UN Security Council on Women, Peace and Security. There was a lot of celebration. And so those moments, women spend a lot of time celebrating. Today, when we score one gain, instead of spending a lot of time celebrating as we did in the past, there's a lot of coming back to say, how do we strategize to ensure that this is sustained, but also prepare for the next challenge that we may be faced with? So it is never ending, but what we are showing the world or the rest of the world in the next generation that in as much as it is never ending, our intellectual ability, our strength and our ability to strategize is also always present, is never ending. After you've become so famous, after you've been awarded the Nobel Prize and much lauded, it sounds as if you have absolutely kept to your grassroots beginning, but that's not so easy. I tell people that I'm extremely blessed because not many people come from a grassroots background and have the ability to go back to that background. When I won the Nobel Peace Prize, I started a foundation. Not a foundation that is taking me from Oslo to Geneva to, 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 to Stockholm to other places, but a foundation that takes me to the communities, a foundation that has me working with people and with adults and young children and grassroots women. Before I got on this call with you, I was telling you I was problem solving. And the problems that I was solving was that we just got a request to take four girls into our program four little girls who lost their 30-year-old mother who was buried yesterday. And the father of those four children at the end of the funeral decides that he has no resources to take care of them. So I have agreed to send them to school. The question now is when they come from school, who do they stay with? As we were in the process of solving this problem, I got another call that a child who lived with his father, father had died and that he cannot go to live with his grandmother because his eldest brother is an addict and they're afraid that he might fall into that habit. So I wake up this morning thinking about all of this, talking to you, thinking about global issues, but then I have to deal with finding a home for five young people. If that doesn't ground you, I don't know what else will ground you. Because in countries where you have the resources, you can say, I'll pick up the phone and call social welfare. In my situation, we do not have that. So then I'm on the phone with my staff, I'm on the phone with my husband, and I'm saying to him, oh, we just by accident got one acre of land. So can I, I'm thinking, who can I talk to to get at least $20,000 to build a transit home? Because I know that with this five, it's not going to end. I'm going to have a lot more eventually. So then I have to plan. And in that planning, it means I have to go back home and going back home, I'm not just dealing with this, but I have to deal with their need for food, their need for shelter, their need for counseling, and all of these different things. So somehow that grounds me. It reminds me that you got this prize, not because of Oslo, not because, but because of your current or where you find yourself. And then I am also blessed to be able to speak authoritatively to my national government that these are the systems that are not working because I, I, I am at the level that I see these things. And then at the Nash international level, I'm able to say, yes, you're talking education, you're talking all of these things, but this is how it works. So over time, it's been a never ending circle. I don't know how many other Nobel laureates are in my shoes, but I, I feel extremely blessed. Because also, it's not just the challenges, but going back home and seeing the results of the work and how many young people look at you and say, because of you, I too think I can succeed. So it keeps you grounded. Some people walk in at the international level, they've read a lot of dossiers before they come to places like Liberia, Congo, Freetown, other places. So they're already coming with 
the notion of an expert report that have clouded their judgment. I'll give you an example. Um, about seven years ago, we went to Congo and I went leading this delegation for a lot of women, international partners. And a lot of them came having read all of the reports on Congo. And we sit down with about 100 women and they're telling their stories. And I'm writing. But I realized that from the media to our partners, everyone was asking questions, reinforcing the whole culture of rape. No one was asking anything of these women. So the international people who were at that meeting were hearing one thing, and I was hearing another thing. I was hearing, yes, we were raped. Yes, we've suffered, but the women came. But everyone else was hearing rape and suffering. No one was hearing women came. So I said, stop. I'm hearing from all of you, the women came. And they're like, well, yeah. So every time one of us were assaulted, one of us were in a hospital, the women came to visit and they provided so psychosocial support. They provided economic support. They provide. So everyone was only hearing the pain and suffering. They weren't hearing the solidarity and the work that was being done. Hmm. So I had to like break it down to people that, yes, there are these problems, but there are also these solutions. The Bowie Peace Foundation, together with the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, have been training women as peace brigades all over Liberia. Their task is to keep the peace by addressing violence against women in their communities. Lema Bowie tells a story of when one of the brigades was visited by evaluators from the UN. Then the women said to them, come, we want to show you something. So they take them on a farm. They said, this is our cassava farm. We sell cassava, we put the money in a bank. And then someone said, but this project is not an economic empowerment project. So why are you making a cassava farm? And the women said, it's simple. Every time there is a case of rape, when we take it to the police, they tell us they do not have money for petrol, or sometimes they do not have money. The parents of the victim doesn't have money to take them to the hospital to get a good doctor report. With our cassava farm and our savings, this is the funding that we use. We're working for access to justice. By having funding, we're providing justice. But theoretically, the evaluators weren't thinking that way. Hmm. It's difficult because it, you know, these are local solutions. It's what it's really saying is that the people who can understand how to navigate all these problems are the people who are living through them. And if you don't listen to them, there's no hope of solving the problems. You see, the other thing about being grounded is, and I bring it back to the question of being grounded, is that at the grassroots level, I'm able to know what I'm just saying to you. So then I come to an international meeting and I make a case that instead of giving millions to all of these big donors to go into countries where they stay at the capital city and barely go into the field to do this work, put the actual money into the hands of the grassroots women. And most times you hear most donors say, we can't give our money because they don't have offices, they don't have websites, they don't have this. But in those communities, they, they don't need offices and websites and all of those things because their work is in the field. Their work is in the community. And yes, there's issues of accountability, but some of these people with some of the problems that they solve, they don't even need millions in the year time. A lot of these women work with, if you ask them for the annual budget, even if they get $10,000, that's a lot of money for the work that they're doing. But most times it's very difficult to get people to trust them enough to put the money in their hands. So one of my recommendations over time has been for example, there's all this money floating around with the EU, the UN, and then there's this whole conversation about, oh, there's a serious competition between the women's organization when it comes to money. We don't need to compete. Put out a grant announcement and say, a women's organization working in the city, pairing with a women's organization working in the rural area, do a joint proposal. In that way, you're putting money in the hands of these women but you're also encouraging partnership 
and discouraging competition. So these are some of the things that being grounded help you to see that a lot of people are unable to see if as they operate from that level. It's extraordinarily vivid the way you paint it. It makes such total sense. One can't see any other way of doing things, but goodness, it's strange that it has to come as a revelation, if you like. Take me back to your pre-1989 life in Monrovia. What were you like as a child? Oh my God, I was bubbly, I was happy. I had a good life. Um, We were very lucky. My mother had five daughters, we didn't have a brother. And we were very lucky, we had a grandmother who was a feminist from the get-go. I just lost my grandmother this January, she was 115. My goodness, Al, I'm terribly sorry. What a, what a loss. Yes. And she read all of us girls. My grandmother, when she was about 14 or 15, she got married. She was married off. Apparently, she was a victim of molestation. And by the rules at that time, she had to marry her abuser. And she had a son. She says maybe two weeks into having her son, she was beaten by her husband. She ran away and left the child with them because at that age, she knew that domestic violence was a no-go area for her. And that was our socialization, that you fight for yourself, you will be somebody, you will do this. Fortunately for us, we also had a father who was an only child So we were like his world. And he would persistently say, I don't care if my daughters don't get married as long as they're educated. For an African man, that was revolutionary. My mother used to be so upset. You all need to learn to cook. You need to learn to bake. You need to learn. And he'd be like, no, they need to learn to go to school. So there was all this real high self-esteem. We went to Christian schools private schools um, growing up. And we were all, so by our faith, we're Christians and by religious affiliation, we're Lutherans. So in the Lutheran church, we had, I was a member of the Icolite. My sister was a member of the choir. I think what they did for us was to thrust us into doing things in public, like getting used to public speaking, Mm -hmm. public, all of the different things. And then after high school, I, I mean, after junior high, I went to an Episcopal high school and there I got involved in student politics and I was not looking to be president. I just loved being in the Senate of my school. And as part of being the Senate of my school, eventually I was voted somewhat like the, like the prime minister, the foreign minister. So I would represent my schools at different schools. Our social life was awesome we would go to basketball games. So it was a bubbly, happy, think about any 17-year-old in a normal city, but also is a 17-year-old that was really pampered because when my parents had me, there was a stretch before they had their last child. So technically, I was treated like a last child. (laughs) Right. You know, so, and then because I used to have a lot of childhood illnesses, so people paid a lot of attention. I, I think I was smarter, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, everyone was space. So it was a very happy time. We had a good time growing up. That sounds fantastic. I may have misheard this, but did you also say that you were lucky not to have a brother? Yes, we were. Tell me why it's lucky not to have a brother. Well, I, I think in those days and years, we would have had to we probably would have been cast aside because in the decades of those times, the boys were very, very important to families. And a lot of our friends who had brothers will see how they struggled because all of the attention, all of the resources were poured into these boys and the girls had to literally serve them and do, but we did not. So we're very, we're very blessed that we didn't have to deal with that. We didn't have to, because I think having a brother would have meant um, us trying to prove ourselves intellectually in every way to our parents that we could, we were deserving of going to private school, we're deserving of doing this. I don't know how that would have played out, 
but probably for our mother, it would have been very important because for years she yearned for a son. So my, I was the fourth girl and my name is Lewoma. That has been warding lies to Lima. And it means, what is it about me? It's like a lament. So she was like, why can't I, what is it about me? I can't have a boy. <laughs> that's, that's the meaning of that name. To have a name that is a lament, that's an extraordinary burden to carry. Well, I don't see it as a burden. So some days I, when I, I joke her and say, see, <laughs> see, you know, but yes, that's the, all of our names um, in our family, all five of us have names that, so by our tradition tells the story. My oldest sister who passed some years ago, name is Siane, which means the journey was good. My mother went to visit her in-laws and she gave birth. Well, no one expected that she was. My sister Mala and I, my sister Mala actually lives in Sweden. Her name is Mala and it means like, it's like a sarcastic thing of, everything is just in a name you know it's just in a name it's just like so it's it's just in a name that i have a husband is so there's nothing or it's just in a name that i so that's that's her name my sister josephine is called pepe and in the pele uh, kiong it means spicy like when she was a <laughs> child she was very she used to cry a lot so they named her like a feisty child and then me and then the last of us is called Nagli. It means remember and remember that I'm done. This is my last <laughs> child. You know, so we all, our names or in our tradition, our names tell stories. They certainly do. And they also carry so much of the kind of character of your parents. That's fantastic. Yeah. It, it also carries the, the, the moment, I would say, they were in, in their relationship. Hmm. Okay, so... You can, if you look at some of the names, you know that this was a bumpy time. This was a happy time. This was so, yeah. But all of our, um, within our tradition, that's the way it's done. Liberia has a complicated history. It was founded by free slaves who left the United States in the 1820s to start a new life in Africa. But many of them had internalized the ideologies of their enslavement, and soon an apartheid-like system was formed, where the indigenous people were treated like second-class citizens. They were sent to separate schools, where they would learn trades to serve the Americo-Liberian population. In 1980, there was a violent coup, and Liberia had its first indigenous president. Nine years later, the regime was overthrown by Charles Taylor, a descendant of free slaves, an event which marked the beginning of the Liberian Civil War. For me and my family in 1989, we, we, we were, we've been in, we were internally displaced maybe four or five times. We escaped death, like really escaped death. In July 1990, you heard about the famous Lutheran Church massacre. We were at the church compound and they came to us in the afternoon, loaded a few individuals in a pickup and killed them. We ran away. That night, they came to the church and killed a whole bunch of people, about 250 people. So we moved and then eventually we left and went to Ghana as refugees. So we we were refugees maybe three times in Ghana. Um, so so you're, you're bubbly, happy, vivacious world just totally fell apart. Totally fell apart. July of 1990, I woke up a 18 year old, ready to go to university because they, we were still thinking the war was in the north. And by 10 o'clock in the afternoon, I became an adult because the shooting had taken over our entire community. I had to make decisions on where we hide, what, how to take care of people, what, what, what. So one minute I was a teenager and the next minute I was a woman. And I tell people I've never gone back to any of those. I never went back to being a teenager because my mother left that morning with my older sister. And by the time she came home, three days later, she was too traumatized too. Because she said when they drove that morning, they got to the barracks area 
The car was confiscated from her by gun-toting soldiers. They ran to a nearby house of a church member and they stayed flat on the ground for three days in the midst of heavy shooting. When the shooting subsided, they crossed through the swamp to come back home. And when she came home, she was never herself. She was so traumatized that the entire period of the war, I literally had to tell her, get up. So yeah, I am a 17 year old now making decisions for my mother and for my younger sibling because my older siblings were also all at different places. Yeah. Now we know how resourceful and strategic and sensible you are. Were you immediately like that? Did you transition straight away to being kind of oh, definitely. capable? Yes. I, I think it was always there. I think um, from high school, going to doing all of this, I think there was always that thing in me that I don't know what it was, but leadership skills, people will call it. But like that night when the shooting started that afternoon, my nieces and nephew who mother lived somewhere else were out playing. And when the gunfire, people were running. I was inside, so I had to run outside, collect, all, and like bullets were raining. This is the first time in my life, collect all of them, take them inside, and put them away from the windows. So they're sitting in the hallway. And then my auntie comes to me and say, your parents are not here. This is their house. You are in charge now. This is like 10 in the morning. By 5 p.m., we have maybe 25 people who go to the same church as us. They're all internally displaced. They need place to stay. So automatically, I'm now thinking, okay, I have to put a mattress here, put a mattress there. Then I'm going into my parents' room and sorting out documents and things that are important to put them into bags. My mind is just reeling. And then we, we have to ration food because we don't know how long these things will last. And yeah, so in three days, I take complete charge of the house. I wake up in the morning and say, this is how much breakfast people will cook. Even though I didn't have to cook, my aunties were there. And this is how much lunch we have to cook. So when my mother was coming, there was this sigh of relief. Yes, finally, I can be a child again. And I could not be a child. I could not at all. Like, literally, I couldn't because she didn't have the ability. Every time I would say, Mama, so what are they going to cook to this? And she, you could hear that for a long time, her voice could barely come out. I don't know if trauma does that to people, but she was just like, I don't know. You do whatever. I, I don't have the strength. You do whatever, you know? And, and it exacerbated after we became displaced, we moved from our house to the church compound. And my father worked for the government and we're told that we were targets. So we left and went to town. He actually came to get us. And so when we went to town, we didn't have the luxury of food because we couldn't hear from our father. Some people were saying he had died. So every morning I would wake up, put on my sneakers and walk to go to find food. So like seven in the morning, I would leave and had to be back before two because then by six was curfew. So one day I came back from looking for food and saw my mother really devastated again. And she said, this guy had come and she saw him picking in the garbage. And she stood up and went to him and said what he was looking for. He said he was looking for kernels. She said, what do you, are you going to do? He said, well, oh, that's what we will crack the kernels and my kids and I will eat it. And she said, oh no, I'll go and bring rice for you. Rice in those days was gold dust. You could get killed for having even one thing of rice like this. So she went in and she got five cups of rice because we still had some rice. And she came and handed it to him through the wire fence. And he said, thank you. And she turned and went and sat down. As soon as he was about to leave, a truck of army men came and stopped and asked him what he was carrying. And he said, rice. And they said, who gave it to you? He did not want to show her. So he said, someone. She stood up and she was walking to say, I give it to him. They executed the man and took that small rice. So one minute she was talking to him, one minute she was giving him rice, the next minute the soldiers had executed him right there. 
So I came and met her crying that she had killed someone. Good God. So then she just went from maybe two to zero. Jumping forward, in 2002, as you've spoken about many times, God came to you in a dream. And listening to you, it is, to me, (laughs) rather obvious why God might come to you. You were well equipped to take this fight on and to unite the women and help end the civil war. But why do you think God visited you? I don't know. I mean, you ask this question as if you were sitting in my living room this morning. I was just telling my daughter, I don't know what God wants from me again, because, yeah, I am looking for housing for five children. But every day I ask myself, I think just the willingness to do, I I have this thing in me that if I, if there is a problem and I'm told about it, I do my damnest to solve that problem. And so maybe is that my heart of willingness to always go the extra mile, not expecting anything, Hmm. not expecting any commendation. There are some days you want to be commended. Everyone wants to be recognized, but it's not the drive for me. So maybe that's why I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, but also I like I hate suffering. I hate to see people suffer. When I have money or things, my response to people telling me, "Oh, you give too much," my response is, "If I don't give, what else can I do?" It's just things. Um, my husband and children have heard me say this many times: "It's things, it's money, it's just my time." You know, it's my energy. If I don't, someone else will. But there is always this willingness to, I don't think there's a moment in my head where I've slowed down. It's persistently thinking how to change things, how to help this person, how to do that. You know, I was telling someone recently, if I had $20 million, I would solve 20 million problems, you know, because... Problems will always be there, but we see all of these problems and the answer we need to give us, or the question we ask ourselves, how many people have the willingness to say yes? There are many people who will say yes. Hmm. How many people have the willingness to keep going? There are few people who will keep going. How many people who have the willingness to keep going in the face of challenges? Not many. So the yes will be many. The keep going will be about 80%. In the midst of challenges, it will be maybe 40%. Additional challenges, maybe 20%. Extra challenges, maybe 10%. Extra, extra. So I I see myself as the one who never gives up, always thinking, how do I change this? Yeah. So did you, after you had this message in 2002, did you ever think of stopping? Or was it, were the people around you just so supportive that it, you couldn't stop? So when I had the dream, it was like, this is not my dream (laughs) because I'm a sinner. I drink. I have a boyfriend I'm not married to. And all of the things that we read in the Bible that makes us to think we're going straight to hell or that has taught us that we'll go to hell if we don't change. And then the pastor who was my boss at the time, I said to him, call the church people. Let's give them this dream. And he said, no, Levan. The dream bearer is always the dream carrier. See, if you give your dream to someone, you will never recognize it the next time you see it. And so you have to. So I started, there was this willingness to start. But then there were moments where when the criticism started, I would be like, if my life, my private life, is going to lead to this problem, then I might as well step back. And then there was always this group of women who would come in quote scriptures to me and say, God used the foolish things of the world to confront the wise. Think about David. He was an adulterous man. Think about Rahab. She was a prostitute. So they would list all of these people and say, think about all of them. They were all sinners. 
but God used them to accomplish his purpose. He's using you. And so in those moments, it was not me staying. It was those women encouraging me, encouraging me, encouraging me to stay. But even as I stayed and they encouraged me to stay, there was always this tenacity to fight for them. You know, so one of my women, we came from protesting. There was this call that she had been taken to prison by her landlord because she couldn't make her rent. We were about 20 that got there and the police said, no, they couldn't release her. And we were standing and thinking, what do we do? Because we already had the money to pay the rent. Right. And they said they won't take it. She had to sleep and they will process her for court the next day. So we sleep in that prison with her that day. And we all just sat in the tight lobby of this thing. And we would sing through the night and pray through the night and tell stories through the night until like 6.30 in the morning, someone went and got two brushes and eight o'clock we went to the court. But afterwards, we went to the transitional president and made a case for them to do a law abolishing the kangaroo courts that we had in the country. So till today, we don't have those kangaroo courts anymore. Leima Bowie is in New York City, where she serves as executive director of the Women, Peace and Security program at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. On a wall in her flat in New York hangs a special painting. In the center of the canvas is the laureate herself, smiling and surrounded by her family. She has seven children and her four daughters are staying with her in New York, one of many things in her life that bring her joy. Joy is actually a word that you've used several times to describe work in a way. You obviously do get great joy from what you do. Oh my God, yes. I, I, I am blessed to be at a place where I enjoy what I do. It is so, like now with the young people on our scholarship, I am so like, it's, when I see them, like two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and I see them and I'm like, yes, you know, there's always this happiness. So I, I tell people when I'm old, I will have a very good life. <laughs> Not that I will be rich, but that I will look at all of those photographs of my students and the young people I've mentored. And I will really say, thank you, God, because you gave me the best job on earth. And the job is to serve people. And by serving people, I'm serving God. Yeah. That's very beautiful. But I don't think you're going to have time to be looking at your photographs because I think you'll be busy solving problems and jumping on the next challenge that somebody rings you up and tells you about. I, I, I definitely think so too, but I think I'll still be smiling somehow. If you had to hope what it is that people will remember most about what you've done in the future, what would it be? I have encouraged young people to believe that they can do whatever they put their mind to. That's a simplified way, that's the first thing. But the second thing that I, I, I said this during the Nobel is that by the time my time on this earth is over, I want to be remembered as that Nobel laureate that didn't have any protocol that could work with anyone, that could be in any space, that could embrace and engage anyone. So if anything, to be remembered as the available laureate, as <laughs> some people call me in Liberia. <laughs> I like that. That's what I hope to be. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Cardin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, Magnus Yilje, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. In season three, we welcome guests from all six prize categories. Physics Laureate Didier Coulot, Literature Laureate Wole Soyinka, 
Medicine Laureate Elizabeth Blackburn, Chemistry Laureate Joachim Frank, Economic Sciences Laureate Paul Milgram, and the guest we just heard, Peace Laureate Lema Bowie. You can find previous seasons and conversations on Acast or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to hear from another great African storyteller, tune in to the conversation with poet, playwright and novelist Wale Soyinka. Thanks for listening. <laughs>